Well, good morning, everybody. I would like you to turn, please, uh, once again to Galatians for the last time. This is our 15th message as we've gone through the book of Galatians, and we want to read from verse 11 uh, down to verse 18. Galatians 6, verse 11, down to 18. It begins this way. It says, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So as we consider this final section of Galatians, remember we're in a section where we've been emphasizing the law. In fact, he's mentioned three different laws that have divided up this chapter. To a people who are enamored by the Mosaic law, he is suggesting to them, look, if you really want to be involved in law, here's three laws that I want you to consider. The first one is the law of Christ. And of course, we saw that in, in verses one through five, but particularly in verse two, bear ye one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And then verses six uh, down to verse 10, we considered another law, the law of the harvest. And of course, it's to do with uh, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Verse 7, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law of the harvest, sowing and reaping. And so it wants them to consider that. But what are they sowing? Are they sowing to the flesh? Are they sowing to the spirit? Because they'll reap, reap uh, respective harvest. And then this final section uh, from verse 11 through 18 deals with the law of the new creation. And we get that from verse 16, although we're going to be considering it in the entire section. But it says in verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule or under this law, if you like, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. And what is that? What is that law that they're under? Well, it's the law of the new creation. Verse 15, in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature or the new creation. So these are the three things. He says, if you want to concentrate on law, here is what you should do. We also said that chapter six really just flows out of chapter five. And it's talking about what does the man who is walking in the spirit and who is led by the spirit, what does he look like? And we get a kind of a description of what he's like in verses 1 through 10 in relation to the church. How does he conduct himself in the church? Well, he's concerned about his brethren. Uh, he, he sees somebody overtaken with a fault. He cares about him. He goes and ministers to him. He's concerned about all God's people. He's concerned about the ministry of the word of God. Somebody ministers the word of God. Uh, he reciprocates uh, in terms of uh, having practical fellowship with the servants of God because he wants God's people to be edified. So what a spiritual man looks like in the assembly, we considered that last time. Now in a more general sense, it's what he looks like when it comes to the world. But he begins uh, in verse 11 with what some have said is really kind of the concern of Paul. And this is how we're going to divide up today. Verse 11, we're going to think about the concern of Paul uh, verse 12 through 15, he wants to look at the value of circumcision. So the concern of Paul, uh, the, the value of circumcision, what value is it? Uh, we'll see that in 12 through 15. And then verse 16 through 18 will be the closing remarks. So that will nicely take us to the end of our study.
So first of all, in verse 11, we see the concern of the Apostle Paul. He says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Usually, uh, these letters were dictated to somebody else. And usually the, the writer uh, would just write kind of the last line or the last segment, but it would usually be dictated. You'll see that in most of Paul's letters, that they're actually dictated letters. You see that with Peter's letters too. There's two views as to what Paul is meaning here in verse 11. The first view is this, and it, it goes back to this idea that his thorn in the flesh was to do with his eyesight. If you remember back in chapter 4, verse 15, he talks about where is then the blessedness you speak of, for I bear, rec bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And so many have concluded from that, that Paul's problem, his thorn in the flesh, was an eye problem. Uh, maybe as a result of the stoning he had received in Lystra, uh, could have been lots of different reasons, could have been many suggest it's chronic ophthalmia that was the root of his difficulty. And, and so basically, uh, Galatians are willing to give him their eyeballs if they possibly could uh, to put right this damage. And of course, for a man of Paul's uh, studious nature, uh, he, the books and the parchments, remember in Second Timothy, he's in the prison and he asks for a cloak to keep him warm and, and send the books and the parchments. He's a scholar. He wants to be reading and studying. And, and of course, uh, one of the great losses to somebody uh, who is a reader is if they have eyesight that, that begins to go. So many believe that that's what's in view here. And so the idea is that this letter was so important to Paul that rather than uh, just dictate it. He he wrote it all himself, and he wrote it because of his eye problem. He writes it with such large letters. You can imagine a slow and painful process as he writes this out. And part of the, the this thought behind it is this. Such was his burden for the saints in Galatia. It, it, in other words, this whole letter flows out of burden. I'm burdened for you. That's why I'm writing this letter. I'm writing it even though it's a painful process. I'm doing it slowly. I'm doing it painstakingly. And I'm doing it in large letters uh, because of my eye issue. And I'm doing it because uh, I so care about you. And I don't want you to be led astray by this false teaching. So that's, that's one view. The other view uh, is, and this is the... I'd say most commentators would hold to this view that that it's hard for us to uh, two thousand years later to diagnose what's going on with Paul uh, in the absence of the the patient or the corpse. It's hard enough for people to diagnose somebody when they're alive in front of them. Never mind two thousand years after the event when we don't actually have the patients. Patient. So most commentators consider that he used large letters deliberately because. He's treating his readers like children. They're going back to the weak and beggarly elements. They're going back, in a sense, uh, backwards on the law, uh, back to, as it were, th that being under that schoolmaster, back to being children. And so he's treating his re readers just like children, rebuking their spiritual immaturity by using baby writing. Or, again, the suggestion is simply for emphasis. Sometimes if we want to emphasize something, maybe we're uh, often in my notes, if I want to emphasize something that I don't miss, I'll put it in bold and I'll put it in full caps so I don't miss it. And, and maybe the idea is this, that, that he is so concerned about them going astray that he is writing to them to emphasize and he's doing it kind of like in bold caps, in large letters, because he, he really wants them to get it. Uh, whatever way, it, whatever's the correct interpretation, uh, and, and I would most likely lean towards the second, because it's just difficult to really diagnose what was going on. But uh, wh whatever the reason is, we, we can sense that either way, it's flowing out of a heart of burden for God's people in Galatia. He's desperately concerned about them. He is desperately concerned about them being led astray by these false teachers, being deceived, being 
brought under this spell of these false teachers. And so he's writing out of great burden and concern. And again, the challenge is, does our ministry flow out of burden for the spiritual well-being of God's people? Or are we just filling a calendar? You know, cause it's it's there's two ways to look at this, right? Some people it's just filling a calendar. They just uh, they they want to fill fill their calendar. They want to keep busy and no real exercise, no real burden. It's just filling a calendar. On the other hand, there are those that minister, and they minister because they are burdened about the state of the church. They're burdened about the state of God's people. They're burdened about God's people being led astray by false teaching in our day, in our generation. Uh, we talk about the latter times, many will depart from the faith. We talk about days where uh, people are going to give heed to doctrines of demons. And so uh, are we ministering out of a, a heart of burden for the people of God? One thing we could say, whatever the explanation is, we do know this. Paul writes to these saints in Galatia out of a deeply burdened heart. And I pray that ministry in our assemblies will come from hearts that are burdened for the people of God. It won't be just a case of, well, oh, I've got to fill a calendar. I've got this day on my schedule. I better get something together. And, uh, you know, anything will do, just fill. No, no, burden. Uh, burden for the people of God. This is what's behind it. And of course, even in the gospel, burden for lost souls. Or oh, what a difference it makes when a preacher preaches, and he's not just given a gospel message, but he's given a gospel message out of a heart of deep burden for lost sinners. Oh, it makes all the difference. And so we see this, that, and I think it's important for us to understand this. So then we, we get to the next section in verse 12 through 15. And now we're thinking about uh, Paul's evaluating because they're putting so much stress on circumcision. He wants to kind of evaluate it. What is the value of circumcision? And so he's taking us back to the immediate circumstances of his writing to them. What's this letter all about? It's about these people who are trying to get them to be circumcised. And as a result of that, putting themselves under the whole Mosaic law. And so he wants his readers to learn three vital lessons concerning circumcision. The first two lessons are to do with its value, circumcision's value to the false teachers. Why are they pushing it so much? What is the value to them? And he's going to show us the value to them is twofold. Uh, one is uh, it, it kind of, uh, it, well, it helps them escape persecution. That's the first reason. But secondly, it's kind of like a notch on their belt. It's something they can boast in. Oh, we've had so many, you know, it's like some people say, oh, we had so many people baptized last week. Well, we had so many people circumcised last week, and it's something that they can boast in. So in other words, the value to the false teachers is all connected with them. It keeps them out of persecution, and it kind of gives them a little score sheet of how well they think they're doing because of that. So that's part of the first aspect what about the value to the recipients? That's the, the the third aspect. And the third aspect is simply this. The value to the recipients is zero. Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. The only thing that's ultimately going to count is this. Are they new creatures in Christ? It doesn't matter whether they're circumcised or not circumcised. What matters is, are they new creatures? Have they been born from above? Are they born of God? Uh, are, are they truly uh, in a relationship with God through union with Christ through the new birth? This is really what matters. Circumcision doesn't really make any difference at all. So as we work through it, you'll see uh, that he's dealing with evaluating circumcision in this section 12 through 15. So notice he says in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Sadly, I want you to notice he has to use the word as many. In other words, this thing is spread. Initially, it was one. It was one individual uh, remember back in chapter 5, verse 7, he says, you did run well, who did hinder you? And, and then he goes on and he, he, he talks, I, I would, they, it's growing, verse 12, were even cut off, which trouble you. So it starts out with an individual, 
It becomes a they, it's grown in number. And now, tragically, the circumcision party has reached the many stage. It's a tragedy, isn't it? It's amazing how false doctrine spreads and grows. And we can see that, can't we? Uh, the growth of the cults, the, the the growth of false ideas and false philosophies. They seem to they seem to grow uh, very speedily. And so now there are many that are desiring to make a fair show in the flesh. Many false teachers. And what's behind it? Well, this fair show. The translation says they they desire to make a good impression. Uh, you know, legalists always love outward show the externals is really what lights their fire it really does uh, they, they like a fair show in the flesh they like externals without necessarily inner reality and that's a danger for all of us isn't it it's something we've got to watch we, we know what's expected of us externally and so it's easy to wear the right outfit to carry the right Bible, uh, the right hymn books, you know, and you're one of the boys and everything's good. And yet spiritually, you can be a million miles away from the Lord, but the show must go on. And so these people, they love outward show. And so uh, they wanted to a big show before men. Uh, that's what they wanted, uh, the, the fair show in the flesh. It's interesting, those who walk in the spirit don't want to please men, but they want to please God. Those that walk in the flesh are generally men pleasers. They want to impress men. And so this fair show in the flesh. So they wanted the Galatians to become circumcised so that they could wear the submission of these Gentiles as a badge of achievement. Look at how many we've got signed up and circumcised this week, or this month. Even as David had boasted in the 200 foreskins of the Philistines that he had killed, so these legalists wanted the allegiance of these Gentiles primarily as a trophy. He got 200. We've got 300. We're, that's, we're, we've got like notches on the belt. That's the idea. Notice, too, he says, uh, desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised or compel you, other translations have. Very important word here. Uh, now, again, we just want to say this. Circumcision, there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to get circumcised or circumcise their child for health reasons. And a lot of people, I know in the U.S., it's very common to, for people to circumcise, not for religious reasons, just because apparently it's supposedly healthier. So they do it for that reason. And there's nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is compelling or constraining a Gentile to be circumcised, saying that he, unless he was circumcised, he could not be right with God unless he puts himself under this mosaic system. Uh, and uh, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised and keep the law of Moses, this kind of thing. And this is the kind of pressure that they were putting on uh, those that were listening to them. They're constraining, they're, they're compelling people to do it. And so it says, uh, that he's, uh, what is the reason? Two reasons. They want to make a fair show of the flesh. They, they, it looks good. It looks good on their, their, their kind of curriculum vitae. You know, we've seen all these people circumcised. We're really doing well. And also the second reason, and the, re the main reason in this verse is, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So here's the real heart behind it all. Not only did they want status before men by having a large following, by insisting on circumcision, they were also avoiding persecution. So persecution is so inseparable from the preaching of the cross. Uh, but to, to insist on circumcision removed the reproach of the cross and saved them from becoming the target of the hatred of the Jews. You see, what they could say to the Jews is, well, we're, you know, we, we believe like you believe. We, we believe circumcision is important. We're, 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 we're with you. Whereas the cross is an end of man and religion. 
<laughs> it, it's saying that there's no way to be saved by the law of Moses. There's no way to be saved by any other means. The cross is the end of every other religious opportunity or system. And so that's why persecution comes as a result of preaching the cross. Legalism is always popular with men, but the pure gospel of the grace of God is usually hated by men. That's just the way it is. Uh, it, it, this reproach of the cross, people can't stand it. They despise it. And so the, they want to avoid that. And so part of the reason they're pushing circumcision is that they want to avoid the persecution that comes from preaching the message of Christ and him crucified. Verse 13, he says, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Paul now brings home the great hypocrisy of these men with their blatant insincerity and pride. They didn't keep the whole law themselves, but they're insisting on the Galatians being involved in keeping it by taking circumcision as a symbol of their commitment to the law. Now, again, let me just say this. It's not possible for them, the teachers, or even their converts to keep the law. One of the things we've seen is that it's impossible for a, a, a rebellious human heart to keep the law of God. And so, uh, basically, the, the tragedy is these people, they were the spirit of the Pharisees was alive and well again in the Galatian false teachers. What do I mean by that? Look back at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, where the Lord Jesus absolutely uh, derides the Pharisees uh, before. Uh, I mean, what a sermon this was uh, for people to listen to this. I mean, these were the religious leaders of the day. And notice what he says in verse uh, 2. He says, uh, this is Matthew 23, verse 2, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So they presume to be the heirs, as it were, to Moses' throne. They sit, sit in his place. They're the modern-day, as it were, representatives of Moses and the Mosaic system. He says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe, that observe and do, but do not yet ye after their works, for they say and do not. You notice the inconsistency? They say, but they don't do it. Does that sound familiar? That's what's going on with the Galatians. They're preaching circumcision, but they themselves don't keep the law. Verse 4, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. All their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, so on and so forth. I think you get the picture. Now, what we see here in Galatia, sadly, is these false teachers are the Pharisees reborn. <laughs> That's what they are. They're, it's almost like that system is back again. And here they are. Uh, they're. They're wanting to make a fair show on the, of the flesh. They want to, all they do to be seen of men. Uh, they don't want to suffer persecution. They want to be accepted as part of the club, part of the boys. And at the same time, they're hypocrites of the highest order. It says, neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised. They may glory in the flesh. They're not going to even keep it themselves, but they want you to sign up to this system. And so, Again, one of the great weaknesses in human nature is boasting in our spiritual success. And so you'll notice here, he says, uh, they desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. And it's it's the idea of, of it's like they, they're, they, they want people to know how many have responded to their ministry and have been circumcised. And it's a little bit like what we see today where uh, people want to boast in the uh, the number of converts uh, in a gospel campaign, kind of notches on the belt. You know, we have we have so many uh, that we can boast of. And, and in some ways, um, 
some organizations even push that. We, we, we were in Ireland and there was, uh, we, we knew a lot of uh, missionaries there. And some of them were with missionary boards where every month they had to fill in a sheet of how many souls they have won to Christ, uh, how many Bible studies they've started, how many. And so it's kind of almost like the system drives this. And, you know, when we talk about conversion, it's a work of God. It really is a work of God. And, you know, sometimes um, we, we don't know if somebody's really converted or not. And it's just such a temptation to have kind of notches on our belt. And it's a snare to be avoided. We have to leave the results with God. And so what we see here is, uh, in this case, they they wanted uh, to glory in your flesh. They wanted to boast in the number of people that had signed up and been circumcised. And so they've got this motive. It's to be, in one sense, to escape persecution and also to glory in men. And so this is Paul's uh, kind of uh, diagnosing their real condition. And of course, how does he know what they're like? Neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the Lord desire have you circumcised. How does he know all that? Well, if anybody knows the heart of a Pharisee, it's Paul, because that's what he once was. Remember, that, that was his life. This was his life prior to conversion. He was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. If anybody understood the mind of the Pharisee, this man did. And so he, he, he can tell you what's going on with them. He knows it intimately because he's been there. That was what he once was. And he understands how they think. And so he says that they may glory in your flesh. And then he goes on in verse 14. He says, but in contrast to them, he says, God forbid, perish the thought that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The false teachers may glory in the mark of circumcision upon the flesh of their converts. Paul can only glory in the cross. I'm not interested in notches on my belt, Paul says. The only thing I glory in is Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Why does he boast in it? For through it, through the work of Christ on the cross, he had been saved from the penalty due to him as a sinner. And so he wanted to boast in this message because it had done so much for him. Uh, when he realized what a sinner he was, he realized he was under condemnation. And now he realized that he's been delivered because of the work of Christ, saved from the penalty due to him as a sinner. He'd been delivered from the deadness of Judaism, from that externalism. He'd been brought into a dynamic, intimate relationship with the living God, uh, coming to know him personally, uh, to know something of, of his spirit working in his life, all the dynamics of a vibrant Christian life. He'd been saved from that deadness of Judaism, and he'd been saved from the present evil age. God had so delivered him through the cross. You know, the cross may be a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians one twenty three. But to Paul, it was the revelation of God's love and grace and wisdom. Through it, he had been brought into living contact with that man who there on that cross died for him. And so he says, I can't boast in anything. My only boast is in Jesus Christ. The cross, him crucified. This is what I boast in. And so he also says that not only does he boast in the cross, but he now declares that by the cross, the world is crucified to him and he to the world. It's a twofold crucifixion. The world is crucified to him and he to the world. The world is dead to him and he to it, we might say. He's finished with it forever. And part of the reason is this. When somebody comes to know Christ and comes to realize the wonder of the cross, a lot of their former companions don't want anything to do with them. So in a, in a, in a sense, the, the world is crucified to them. 
the, the cross, as it were, alienates them from their former companions. They don't want to hang around with this religious person, or even if they are religious, we don't want to hang around with him anymore because he has he has abandoned what he grew up with. He's he's left our religion, and so uh, often the cross brings a great divide with the world, either the uh, the world of partying and all the the carousing of the world or the religious world because it sets apart. It's different from any other message. And so Paul could say, the world is crucified with to me. Uh, it's gone. And I to the world. Uh, he's finished with it forever. The world, of course, here in its broadest aspect, the system all around us that is anti-God and anti-Christ, energized by S Satan, sustained by the ungodly. He said that that cross as as once and for all it has separated me from that world that world that crucified my savior <laughs> now i've identified with him it's cut me off from that world and i from that world crucified uh, marvelous marvelous scripture uh, the by whom the world is crucified unto me and i unto the world this cross is a great theme in Galatians, really. We notice in chapter 3 and verse 13, we, we read, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So this, this cross, it delivers us from the curse of the law. In chapter 5, verse 24, it says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and lusts. And so it was applied to the flesh. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, that happened at conversion, but Paul continues to, as it were, keep himself in that place of crucifixion, as we considered last time. And and then, finally, it's applied to the world. Applied to the law, applied to the flesh, applied to the world. The world is crucified unto me. And, again, as we, we think of the cross, we often talk about that, um, the letters on the cross were in Hebrew and uh, Greek and Latin. And in one sense, what it was saying, written Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but what it was really saying is that this is what the world did to the Son of God. Uh, when it was written, of course, in Hebrew, it's speaking of the religious world. Uh, religion was at its peak uh, during the time that Jesus was crucified. Uh, that's why he talks about the leaves on the fig tree. The, the reli outward religion was just at its max. And what did the religious world do with the Son of God? They crucified him. And then, of course, we, we have the Latin that would uh, speak of the world of politics. Uh, this is the Romans. Well, how did they get on? Well, they, they joined in, didn't they? They, they? they cooperated with the religious world in crucifying the Son of God. What about the Greeks? Well, that's the language of culture, isn't it? That was the, the language of the, the culture, the learning, the arts, all of this. And again, they're not necessarily directly involved in the cross, but we do get a sense, don't we, of what does the world of culture and the arts think of Christ? Well, what we could say is this, that if you go to Hollywood today, which is one of the places where the arts is held up in culture, uh, how do they view the cross? <laughs> Uh, there's no love for the cross of Christ amongst the Hollywood elite, is there? No love for in, in, in the cultural world at all, uh, because the cultural world is often that world that's pushing the envelope, that perversion is mainstream through that cultured world. And so what we can see is that all of them, all of them to, together collaborated in their hatred of the holy, spotless Son of God and cooperated in his crucifixion. The world is crucified to me and I unto the world. I'm done with that world that did that to my son, uh, uh, to, to the son of God, uh, the Savior. And so that is their attitude. Notice again now as we move on to verse 15, uh, he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Circumcision that which marked the Jew, uncircumcision, which marked the Gentile, didn't count for anything as to salvation. Circumcision didn't help in any way 
nor did uncircumcision hinder in any way what was necessary for all men to experience salvation was to become a new creature in Christ, what we call the new creation. That is the only thing that will matter on the day of judgment. Was I born again? Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, the Lord Jesus says. This this new birth, which makes us new part of this new creation of these, these people who are born again, who are reborn, part of the new family of God, connected to the risen man, this group of people, uh, they are the new creation. And that's all that ultimately avails in the day of judgment. Are you a new creature? And of course, the scripture says this, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He's part of that new creation. And so this is Paul's that great emphasis, the importance of being this new creature in Christ. That's really what matters. Circumcision is not the issue. Or uncircumcision is not the issue. It's are you born again? Are you a new creature in Christ? Have you been born from above? Do you have the life of God within you? Have you been to Calvary and been uh, brought into a living contact with this great Savior? Is that what you are? It, without that, you're a lost, helpless soul. Whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, you're far from God. And so he says in verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule. What rule? The rule of the new creation. The rule of boasting in the cross of Christ, glorying in the cross of Christ, because through it, our salvation came. Uh, anyone who walks according to this rule, peace be upon them. Can't be peace on people that have not experienced that, right? Because scripture says, there's no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so the only peace comes to those that have come as new creatures in Christ through the cross, believe the gospel. And so as many as walk according to this rule, peace be upon them. And mercy. Of course, we all fail. We need divine mercy every single day. And yet it says, and upon the Israel of God. So this rule, this principle stated above, all blessing is in the cross realized by those who are new creatures in Christ. And notice again the word many, as many as. We saw it already in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. So there's really two distinct groups here. There's those false teachers, they that make uh, a boast in the flesh, that side of things. And then there's this new as many that walk according to this rule that are those of the new creation. Thank God that there are many that have come to see this, that have come to glory in nothing but the cross of Christ, that have become new creatures in Christ. And we're so thankful that many have come to this place. Now, when it comes to uh, the Israel of God here, this is a very interesting text of Scripture. Some believe that the Israel of God is the true church. The evidence doesn't support this, but many believe that. This is the Reformed view. Generally, the Reformed view only see one people of God, and they believe that the church is the true Israel of God. And so they they base it on this. One of the, the basis for it is this verse. He, he says, peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God, as if uh, that this is speaking of the church. Now, let me just answer that, first of all. First of all, um, the repetition of the preposition upon or to, and so notice it says, and upon the Israel of God, or and we might say to the Israel of God, indicates we're talking about two different groups here. There's the new creation, and then he says, and upon or to the Israel of God, two clear views. Now, the second thing to say is this. There are 65 occurrences of the term Israel in the New Testament. And every one of those references refers to Jews, without exception. So here's the 66 reference. Are we to assume that now this includes Gentiles who are part of the church? And the answer is no. Scripture is, if anything, it is very consistent. And so what we can say is that this is speaking about Israel 
uh, just in the same way that it normally is used, uh, not meaning Gentile Christians and not refer. Now, this view that I'm giving you is not the reform view. It's what we call the dispensational view. The dispensational view is the people that recognize that there is a distinction between Israel and the church. And by the way, whether there are seven dispensations, eight, all, that is in a sense secondary. What's important about dispensational truth is this. It sees a distinction between Israel and the church in the purposes of God. And I do not believe it's possible to properly understand the word of God without seeing that distinction. And that's why I unashamedly would say that I believe in dispensational theology. I recognize, God recognizes the three distinct people in the world, the Jew, the Gentile, and the church of God. And give none offense to 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 32. And so we recognize that there is a difference. So then what does this really mean? What Paul is saying here is this. Um, there are two kinds of Israelites. There are believing Jews and there are unbelieving Jews. We, we see that, don't we, in Romans chapter 9 and verse 6, where it says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So there's definitely two different types of Jews, believing Jews, unbelieving Jews. So when Paul talks about Israel, he doesn't refer the Israel of God we might say the true Israelite, he is not a Gentile who has accepted Christ as his savior, but he is a Jew who has come to understand that Jesus is the rightful Messiah. And he that's the, that's the true Israel of God. And so uh, the Israel of the flesh, what did they do? They crucified their Messiah and uh, came under judgment as a result of it. That's part of the reason for the scattering and all the rest of it. And, and so that's the Israel after the flesh. But the Israel of God is that godly remnant from the nation that by grace believed and turned to the Lord. And so he says the new creation and the Israel of God, those so Paul is saying, I'm not in any way anti-Semitic, I'm not opposed to the nation of Israel, but I recognize who a true Israelite is. It is somebody who is truly born of God, who has recognized who the Lord Jesus really is. And so he talks about the new creation and the Israel of God, not speaking of Gentiles at all. Verse 17, he says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. So he now um, looks to the future, and he doesn't want anyone to trouble him. Now, there's two thoughts here that have been suggested. One is, maybe it's a prayer. He's, he's crying out to God, and he's saying, let no man trouble me. I've just been dogged by these um uh, people who are uh, Judaizers who have followed me everywhere uh, and, and don't want any more trouble. Or, and I think this is perhaps the most accurate thought here, is it's an exhortation to the Galatians. Don't trouble me anymore with this false teaching that you've embraced. Reject it. Turn from it. I, I don't want any more trouble from you. Just embrace the truth of the new creation and walk with the Lord. Forget all this circumcision nonsense. And so uh, having in mind the Judaizers who were constantly insisting upon the mark of circumcision, uh, those activities constantly distressed him and distracted him. And they pursued him everywhere. And as you go through the book of Acts, you'll see that same thing. And so he's saying, don't let anybody trouble me. And then he says this, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. It's an interesting word, stigmata. Uh, some of our Catholic friends, they they tend to think that, you know, the Lord Jesus had wounds in his hands and his side and his feet. And so they talk about a stigmata being uh, when that is replicated in one of their saints. Apparently, Padre Pio is one of those people that they, that's not exactly what Paul is talking about here. He's just simply saying is that he had 
marks found in his body that he sustained out of loyalty to Christ. These Judaizers, they they wanted to avoid persecution. They, they, were, they were marking other people's bodies at no cost to themselves. They were going around, as it were, circumcising their converts, and it didn't cost them anything. But Paul says the marks of the Lord Jesus, all the sufferings he bore and endured as he preached, as he preached the gospel, this is what he was wearing. Uh, for his um, association with Christ and his gospel, he had a back that had been beaten with rods. Uh, he had evidences of stoning. It, all over his body, there was absolute evidence of his loyalty to the Lord Jesus. He certainly had his marks. And, and so uh, the, the evidence of the suffering that he bore. And so he says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, the very thing these people were trying to avoid. He finishes his letter in verse 18 by saying this, brethren, interesting how he started out not by talking about brethren, but by asserting his apostolic authority. As we remember at the beginning, he, he began uh, very bluntly, very directly uh, with these words. He says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ. Uh, and all the brethren are with me the Church of Galatia. So he begins with a with a very direct apostolic authority, heavy authority, but he ends with this term of endearment. He says, brethren. And what does he want for these brethren? He opened his epistle with grace. He's going to close it with grace because he said in verse 3 of chapter 1, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And so he closes with the mention of grace just as he opens with grace. And the very message that he is combating has been the opposite of grace. It's the message of law. It's the message of circumcision. And it's putting yourself under the responsibility of keeping the commandments of God. And his message begins with grace it ends with grace. In fact, in the letter to the Hebrews, he talks about let your hearts be established with grace. And this is really what he wants. He wants them to have their hearts established in grace. The grace, undeserved, unmerited favor that has flown, flowed to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants that to be with their spirit. Now, again, notice not external. He's not looking at external. This is internal. He wants them internally in their spirit, if you like, in the inner man to be established in the grace of God, to get the grace of God, to understand the grace of God. Great emphasis on the inner man. We may not have marks on our bodies like the Apostle Paul had, but we can enjoy the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our spirits even today. And I hope we do. I hope we're, I hope if Galatians has done anything for us, it's made us glory in the cross of Christ and appreciate the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and delivered us hopefully forever from the snare of legalism, externalism, doing things to please men, doing things to avoid persecution, it's delivered us from the snare of being bewitched by false teachers who want to bring us under their sway. But instead, like Paul, maybe we could say today, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Amen. <laughs>